So, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm happy to see you all here at the panel discussion of this afternoon session of the lockdown series, lockdown lessons series. My name is Marc-André Schmachtel. I work for the Goethe Institute, and I've been coordinating this event. Um, uh, and for this afternoon session, I want to introduce the two moderators, um, Sarah Teurer to my right. Uh, she's a, a curator at Haus der Kunst in Munich, and Mario Schof, who is a program uh, a coordinator at Goethe Institute in London. I'm very happy to have them both here, experts in their, uh, in their fields, and I will give you a little introduction into the topic of this afternoon. Thank you very much. Hi everyone, um, thank you Marc-André Schmachtel for the introduction, um, thank you CTM for hosting um, this talk and um, yes, my name is Sarah and um, I'm here with Mario and um, you'll be, um, or you have been involved in the past years um, quite deeply in developing a project um, called DAOVO and I'll hand over to you immediately so you can give us a bit of a background on this. Okay, um, thank you, Sarah. Thank you for this introduction. <laughs> and um, thank you also to the wonderful CTM team um, for hosting us today with such care and consideration as part of their really insightful discourse program this year. Um, all of it is online. If you haven't seen it, you should really um, check it out. It was really fantastic. Um, as our Secretary General Johannes Ebert said earlier um, in his opening words, uh, it's great to be here in this hybrid space and be here with you and also with persons um, engaging with us online. Um, so please indulge me while I um, speak about the project a little bit. I think maybe uh, it will be about five minutes. And um, um, I'd like to say a few words um, to at least in fragments map the journey uh, which took us here today. And it goes back um, about six years at least, when together with uh, Ruth Cutlow, co-director of Furtherfield and Ben Vickers, then curator of digital and CTO at the Serpentine Galleries, uh, we started a collaboration called DAO, as um, Sarah just said, and DAO um, stands for Decentralized Autonomous Organization with Others, um, a term we were very generously allowed to borrow from artist Ria Myers, um, who has also been part of Radical Friends. Um, so um, our ambition was and is um, to see the new decentralized ecology of open source cultural organizations built by artists embedded in distributed global communities and designed to activate collaboration across communities, disciplines and sectors. The first DAO Art and Blockchain Lab and Summit series, which started publicly in 2017 to 2019, convened artists, musicians, technologists, engineers, and theorists in the interrogation and production of new blockchain technologies. Our focus was to understand how blockchains might be used to enable a critical, sustainable, and empowered culture that transcends the emerging hazards and limitations of pure market speculation of crypto economics. And um, the series worked across a, a spectrum of themes and domains um, and of expertise breaking down silos and assumptions about what these technologies might mean. Um, the aim was to birth a new set of experimental initiatives, um, as Ruth Cutlow um, would say, um, to reinvent the future of the arts. In February 2020, just a few weeks before the first international lockdown, uh, we scaled this program internationally and invited cultural practitioners and rep representatives of non-profit arts and technology organizations from around the world to participate in the Art World DAO Think Tank, a 52-hour sorry gathering. And um, this was designed um, by Ruth Cudley and Penny Rafferty, um, who um, f also facilitated this program. And we might hear a little bit more about this later on. Um, and it was really to discuss and analyze and map the obstacles, opportunities, and implications for progressive decentralized art world automation. Um, this intense learning session and retreat allowed cultural community activists to host their own events in their localities and organizations and to prototype a DAO. Um, participants dissected the old art world in brackets, and then drew on the emerging blockchain art space to prototype DAOs as art and for art, to increase solidarity, strangeness, and freedom, to take collective action, and to create new art ecologies, essentially. 
a jury of experts awarded funding to prototypes for progressive art DAOs and art world DAOs um, to five successful teams. And this DAO Global Initiative um, forges a new transnational network of arts and blockchain cooperation uh, with leading international arts and technology institutions and communities in cities around the world. Our ambition was to seed a new decentralized economy of open source cultural organizations built by artists embedded in distributed global communities. And then during the second year of the pandemic, we created the DAO Sessions, Art World Prototypes. This was a new series um, of weekly online events running for six weeks from January to March, um, curated by uh, Ruth Cutlow, Penny Rafferty, and with Ben Vickers, uh, with the Goethe Institute London. Each event introduced one of five new progressive blockchain art um, prototypes created by the DAO teams that have been selected in Berlin, Hong Kong, Johannesburg, and Minsk. And um, so much of this work was really about community building, and we had planned to host the Radical Friends Summit physically at the Hase Kunst in Munich, um, where Sarah is working with uh, uh, Andrea Lissoni, um, whom we also know very well, and we were really grateful to have this opportunity to show our work um, in, in Germany, since we're um, mostly known for uh, working abroad. Um, and rather than postponing this program, we collaborate, collaborated on it as a, st a streamed production four months ago, um, pretty much exactly four months <laughs> ago, <laughs> in January, um, when again it wasn't really possible to travel um, and meet physically. And um, perhaps, Sarah, this might be a good moment for you to say a few words on uh, Radical Friends and how we, um, what we did. <laughs> sure. <laughs> mm. um, thanks, Mario. So um, Radical Friends was, um, we called it a summit, but um, you could also say symposium, um, standing at the end of these um, several years of research from um, different groups, collectives, um, curators, and institutions. Um, so it was already a very collaborative um, effort, um, I would say, um, when I got involved, um, which was um, by the end of uh, 2021, I think. And um, when we held the symposium um, in January, um, we had to do it online, um, as Mario already said, which also made sense because of the um, topics that we were discussing. Um, and the symposium um, departed, obviously, from um, this huge uh, research that had already been done with different groups of people um, presenting their projects and their work. Um, co-curated um, with Ruth Catlow and Penny Rafferty. Um, the symposium also tried to bind together um, all the different ways they had been working. Um, so we had included some bodywork sessions as part of the um, online gathering. Um, we had a keynote lecture by um, researcher Jaya Clara Breck, who um, quite brilliantly um, traced the legacy of uh, DAOs. Um, of decentralized autonomous organizations, uh, both in um, leftist, um, like uh, self-organized groups, as well as in very libertarian contexts. So this ambiguity um, was a big part of our discussion, actually, um, throughout the symposium. And as Mary had mentioned, um, the kind of um, art world DAOs that we've been looking at, of course, um, are a very uh, niche, um, um, yeah, a niche on the blockchain, so to say. Um, thinking of art as a test bed for uh, social constructions, or um, um, yeah, maybe also as we are now discussing um, strategies for um, decentralization or strategies for resisting oppression. Um, we then um, also had some. Uh, lightning talks by experts in the field looking into specific or more specific uh, areas like smart contracts and things that um, institutions like Hauser Kunst or maybe the Goethe Institute um, I think can uh, could even implement um, or should <laughs> and um, 
Yes, so this panel we are on now, um, I think, is sort of an extension of all these topics that we had started to discuss. And obviously, uh, time has uh, moved on. And um, I'm super happy that we're today uh, discussing or will be in conversation um, with uh, EEEFFF, um, who had been part of the Daovo initiative and also part of Radical Friends. Um, so they've been involved in this uh, project since a long time and they'll be presenting a new work, a performance, um, shortly. And we'll be also joined um, by Penny Rafferty, who co-curated um, the Dover Initiative, um, but also the Radical Friends Summit um, with Ruth Kethlow. Um, and um, Oleksii Kaczynski, um, who is joining us uh, from Ukraine. Um, thank you so much um, for taking the time and energy. Um, so we will, um, yeah, just uh, hope you enjoy the performance. <laughs> and um, I'll see you later on stage. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, thank you. Um, I am part of EEFFF and together with Nikolai who is sitting here. And uh, we would like to start uh, with um, a moment of silence uh, in memory of victims of the war in Ukraine. And now um, we will present you actually, not actually a performance, but uh, a computer supported exercises on digital memory, uh, which has a name right now, tactical forgetting, because uh, you are choosing what events uh, are important to remember and what, em uh, what events uh, have to be forgotten for the security reasons of the community or uh, for sensitive information that is contained uh, inside of the message so that maybe sometimes only the bodies uh, carry the information. Um, and uh, these uh, supported exercises uh, will be um, uh, like we re actually reused the um, program which was made uh, in order to train yourself to remember new uh, bits of information um, uh, using spe specific algorithms. So basically it has um, an answer uh, and a question uh, which is kind of two-sided and uh, are connected. Uh, and inside of those um, exercises, uh, we have put uh, our own materials uh, in order to remember some of the revolutionary events that happened uh, and are happening uh, in Belarus, um, started in 2020, um, and also followed anti-war uh, actions uh, to prevent uh, the war in Ukraine. Um, and also, uh, maybe it's important uh, to say that there are different um, kind of narratives uh, inside of uh, these uh, exercises, both um, ours and found. So, and I welcome Nikolai Spisivtsev, uh, who will uh, go through the exercises, and you are invited to remember and to forget 
uh, some of this information. Thank you. To wargaming, for the first time, I go there every day. Near the subway there is a honey hole. Just drove up and again someone goes there. Tell me, becoming a programmer at forties is probably hopeless, right? In general, are there forty years old programmers? Or are they all becoming startuppers at thirty three? He says while we are forcing our way through traffic jams. In general, I think that Belarus is a country of people who would like to become programmers. As one friend of mine says, where all programmers want to be, he laughs. They say that wargaming is such a large office that every third graduate of the Faculty of Mechanics of BSU works there, and every second BSURI, Belarus State University of Informatics and Radio Electronics, student dreams to get there, and even the unemployed see game designers training courses in an unemployment office in their dreams. To be with everyone on a short leg, follow the tenderness of the corridors of your company, stimulate imagination. Attention on an industrial scale. For companies that generate surplus value from screen time, it is important to force users to collaborate inside of platforms owned by these companies. The most important information here is the precise moment at which the content from other users needs to be shown to me. This is done in order to
I calm down when I'm here. It seems that the revolution will begin with unfinished construction. There are three or four points that are underfunded. Some even had their equipment removed. In front of the unfinished building there is a Kremlin-shaped playground, colored plastic turrets. The vigor of the turrets is in harmony with the pace of colonization of this city by the neighboring country. The first thing that was built was a playground. Real estate, real colonization, or maybe just a market employ. One tank Zulu. I say again, we have information from special services that you got bomb on board. And that bomb can be activated over Vilnius. Roger that, stand by. On air one tank Zulu, and for, uh, for security reasons, we recommend you to land and inform Mike Mike Sierra. Uh, the bomb uh, uh, threat message where? Where did it come from? Where did you uh, find the information about it from? An A1 Tango Zulu, stand by please. An A1 Tango Zulu. Go ahead. An A1 Tango Zulu, airport security staff uh, informed they received email. Uh, Roger. Uh, was it the airport security staff or uh, from uh, Greece? An A1 Tango Zulu, this email was shared to uh, Several airports. Uh, I want to Zulu again. Uh, this recommendation to divert to Minsk, where does it? Uh, where did it come from? Where did it come from? A company? Did it come from uh, departure airport authorities or arrival airport authorities? An Air One Tango Zulu. This is our recommendation. The streets are blocked off with concrete blocks, barricades for a non-existent demonstration. This is where the protests had to be made. The cars won't pass here, and the cops will get bogged down in the mud that creeps up from the wounds of the smashed runways. Exit to the city, but not in a sleeping district, a monument to Soviet modernism. But the
На третьем этаже это полностью целый этаж, который посвящен отдыху сотрудников. Там есть мужская э, тренажерка, там есть женская тренажерка, там есть мужские раздевалки женские, там есть залы для аэробики, там есть бильярд, там есть настольный теннис, там есть покер, там даже есть сауны. И, в общем-то, там, там есть, там она определенное время работает, вот, с, с 8 утра до 11 утра и далее с 5 вечера до 9 вечера. Это все работает, чтобы сотрудники не отвлекались в рабочее время. Owns, dreaming, destroys, cheating, automates, jealous, uses, wanna be, leases, destroys, uses, automates, hibernates, jealous, owns, wanna be. To war gaming. For the first time, I go there every day. Near the subway, there is a honey hole. Just drove up and again someone goes there. Tell me, becoming a programmer at forties is probably hopeless, right? In general, are there forty years old programmers? Or are they all becoming startuppers at thirty-three? He says while we are forcing our way through traffic jams. In general, I think that Belarus is a country of people who would like to become programmers. As one friend of mine says, where all programmers wanna be, he laughs. They say that Wargaming is such a large office that every third graduate of the Faculty of Mechanics of BSU works there, and every second BSURI, Belarusian State University of Informatics and Radio Electronics, student dreams to get there, and even the unemployed see game designers training courses in an unemployment office in their dreams. To be with everyone on a short leg, follow the tenderness of the corridors of your company, stimulate imagination, do not let go of attention on an industrial scale. Люди уже собираются, все СХ собираются потихонечку помнить. А до демонстрации еще начало полчаса. Ожидайте остальные информации. How do you feel about these empty windows? A year ago, people used to organize motorcycle races in this place. A year ago, there was no black tape traffic lights at an empty crossroads. There was a takeoff runway, albeit with hollows, but takeoff.
люди уже собираются, все цеха собираются потихонечку по мне. А до демонстрации еще начало полчаса. Ожидайте остальные информации. I come down when I am here. It seems that the revolution will begin with unfinished construction. There are three or four points that are underfunded. Some even had their equipment removed. In front of the unfinished building there is a Kremlin-shaped playground. Colored plastic turrets. The vigor of the turrets is in harmony with the pace of joined the strike until victory, refused to receive a shift assignment and joined the strike. Student strike. The factory is empty. Workers didn't appear to the shift. Workers. Walking a column through the production facilities, gathering people. Started the strike, one of the first in the country, at 0010. Now they are at the factory communicating. We have the new edition again. Another not indifferent person joined the strike. The streets are blocked off with concrete blocks, barricades for a non-existent demonstration. This is where the protests had to be made. I open a chat that I haven't looked at for a week and think about how to quickly scroll through all these messages, how not to get stuck in past conflicts and logistical arrangements of the day before yesterday. A moment and the chat interface will be scrolled on its own. Messages are automatically deleted. Parts of the chat interface begin to move at an inhuman speed. April 14th, May 18th, and between them there is an emptiness. Joined the strike until victory. Refused to receive a shift assignment and joined the strike. Student strike. The factory is empty. Workers didn't appear to the shift. Workers walk in a Have you ever programmed anything for a family? Me? No, he paused. But my father, back in the days when there was no internet, created a program to calculate a family's budget. It was a gift to his wife for the wedding. I'm sitting in a tank. The tank is in the lobby of a 16th floor business center. I'm smiling. The tank is small. My head is ridiculously sticking out from the tank. While I am photographed, I think about our labor inspection and what it can give us. How can we know if the dreams of those who work here come true? The dreams of all who keep the world of tanks afloat. Programmers wanna be. The phrase is spinning in my head.
Thank you so much, Zina and Nikolai. Um, this was uh, the performance tactical forgetting. And I guess I'll start. My first question would be, um, what is this tactical forgetting? How should we learn it um, and, and what, is the, what kind of strategy is that? Actually, the um, idea of uh, having this name, uh, the title, uh, Tactical Forgetting, born out of the um, um, very specific situation of um, technologically aided uh, protest and uh, in broader revolution in Belarus, when uh, this idea of having a public space and some uh, democracy with all this transparency underneath the concept of, the, of it, uh, didn't work because what uh, the new institutions needed uh, was not uh, transparency but some working machines based on a more complex structure and with these questions raised, uh, the question about archive and the visibility raised as well and uh, so that realized that we need not only the machines for remembering, but the techniques and tools for forgetting to survive or to hide or to prolong the activity. So transparency isn't necessarily um, only a positive feature of the digital space, but it's also something that we have to somehow claim back or, um, or engineer in a way, right? Um, and I wonder, um, Alexis, since um, you've been um, uh, writing also about these uh, kind of oppressive uh, um, algorithmic oppression or um, the problems of um, digital infrastructures, um, how, how would you um, react to the performance that we've just seen? Or this question of um, transparency? Well, yeah, um, like, um, I personally was, uh, yeah, first of all, thank you for your kindest introduction and for this performance as well. Mm, first of all, I, I would like to admit that, uh, mm, uh, like, I'm deeply impressed by that, let me say, kinetic, like, non-linear, special temporal, temporal relations which were introduced by this uh, performance uh, because um, it actually uh, like somehow um, reconstruct that way uh, in which uh, some, something which is only potential which could appear like that uh, news about uh, missile attacks or rocket uh, uh, bombings or, or some kind of uh, police violence uh, or surveillance, uh, surveillance uh, which these this things which are only potential uh, can influence the actual uh, user state yeah if, if I if I could call uh, that uh, subjectivity which is introduced by this performance as a mm, user. Yeah. So, uh, I think that tactical forgetting is something which is deeply related to the question of affective governing. Yeah. Uh, because of that very... Uh, because of that very uh, issue of uh, uh, making patterns by the very flux of data and information. Yeah. So this is something I would like to uh, to admit at, the, at this very moment. 
Yeah, I would also like to add um, a small thing um, that um, those infrastructures, uh, some of them uh, that were raised during uh, Belarusian Revolution were built to forget uh, rather than uh, to remember things because the revolution it uh, is happening right here and right now. So um, there is no, uh, no questions of archiving these uh, materials. Uh, um, and, uh, for example, as um, one of the example could be different uh, bots uh, that were built, um, were programmed to clean up the messages in a neighborhood chat yards uh, in order to provide the safety for the community. And so, uh, in a way, uh, like as um, uh, there was one of the exercises, you, you open up a chat and you see the dates just flowing um, uh, behind you and you can't read. You just see that um, those memories are disappearing from one side, but, but from another side, um, the present is much more important, like what are we going to build uh, right now. And I guess that's also um, the question, as you say, it's in the present. So um, sort of locating um, strategies for decentralization um, or locating, um, let's say, social organizing, right? It's like, where is it happening? And if it's happening in a, in a chat room, um, who controls it and um, what happens, for example, if in the example that you just gave, um, if we optimize trust, is that um, something um, beneficial and what are the potential pitfalls maybe um, of these strategies? Or maybe Penny, you want to speak about <laughs> the trust question as well. <laughs> you want to answer or you can Please. start? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, in terms of the automation of trust, it's probably impossible due to the fact that technology isn't a system that we can solely trust in itself. Similarly, what was very apparent to me over the performance was not only this notion of tactical forgetting, but what really rang home to me was this moment of also having sort of um, an overview effect of like how we actually consume media, because a lot of modes of going through that performance were very reminiscent to me of like how I actually engage with media that's given to me. And then the next part of information or fractured news position that could be true, trusting, untrustworthy, and the way in which one's mind almost becomes like a plurality of kaleidoscopes of potential eyes and minds that we enter into, but we, in a sense, do trust our eyes, but at the same time, we cannot. And I think this is very similar in terms of when we think about decentralization or technology or um, Vitalik Buterin, who actually was the first person to create the Decentralized Autonomous Organization, just released an article where he said that in the future we will have soul tokens, which will manifest a trusting system within certain social positions, be it teachers, care workers, and so forth. And these systems we already do have in a certain way through paper bureaucracy, um, particularly if you want to work in the schooling system, for example, in Europe, you have to go through police checks and so forth. But these are systems to which we may not have been caught, therefore we are trusted until the moment to which we are caught in doing a wrong doing. And so these things are almost a kind of problematic in a time-space continuum. And they're not always present, 
because we do not have always the chronicles at hand. And I think that was something that was like really interesting for me was not only the understanding of the activation of forgetting, but also to know we are naturally forgetting. Yeah, I guess forgetting is something um, we do, and it's almost um, impossible for an online archive or an automated archive to forget in that sense, right? So uh, maybe this goes back to um, what we've been discussing also during Radical Friends, this question um, you raised actually, which keeps like, um, I keep thinking about is um, the the question of offline spaces and uh, social organization predating any kind of digital infrastructure and whether we actually need algorithmic support in organizing or self-organizing. Yeah, um, maybe I can uh, start. Mm -hmm. um, I take a, uh, took a note about, while well, thinking about, and you, you, Penny, speaking about the, um, uh, the trust and the possibility to automatize it. And I start to think about uh, the special condition of the body now, which is, could be um, somehow extended, yeah, uh, with some very difficult uh, and complex relations with these extensions. I mean, uh, um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the case of our research, and uh, which we have presented to you in the, this performance, so that was uh, like a machines for forgetting and uh, like auto semi-automatized archiving, or the perceiving the time and how to teach use or unlearn the previous uh, mode of perceiving the time during the revolution or during the war and uh, find the new ways and new institutions that can support this new mode. And this is, uh, I think, uh, what Dina said about this long-term um, uh, revolution that gave you, uh, us uh, the possibility to establish the new institutions for new time perceiving, for example. Mm, yeah, and um, in these cases, uh, it's difficult to uh, talk about this division between this online and uh, offline presence, uh, but it's more about uh, having the sensorium that can grasp the different modalities. And uh, in this uh, case, when, when we are talking about this automatized trust or, or algorithmicized something, yeah, <laughs> we are talking about this, uh, from me, yeah, uh, about these very specific uh, the conditions of our bodies. As, uh, for example, Alexei uh, wrote in uh, their text um, that is. Uh, that the bodies that can uh, have this footprint of algorithms on their own. And uh, I think we should think about this modality uh, if we are uh, thinking about these uh, algorithmizations of any kind. Because from my experience from this Belarusian revolution, it's uh, when we are using new algorithms or new technologies, this is not because of like metaphysics uh, progress uh, of technology itself. It's more about uh, choosing between to achieve something. And um, sometimes uh, from the inside you could see that, okay, maybe this is the somehow unalienated mode of production of the future maybe, but uh, in more everyday life you could uh, think that it's an even more alienated situation where you cannot control it. Yeah, but, but yeah, I would like to uh, mm -hmm. give the microphone to someone else. Yeah, and also um, like uh, we've been discussing that uh, technology can be treated as um, like addition uh, to the life uh, itself, uh, where if um, uh, like um, in case of 
let's say, hardship situations. Uh, it can only, uh, also sometimes you don't have a choice in particular situation. Uh, for example, uh, the war uh, in Ukraine, like you can't uh, escape uh, uh, the war. So, but maybe uh, Oleksiy can uh, talk about that. Mm -hmm. uh, I also would like to admit uh, the other point, just to catch that uh, flow of thinking, which was introduced by Nicola, that uh, uh, bodies can be seen as something which is articulated through the established machines of perception, yeah, and uh, technologies of perception. So I also um, would like to add that uh, it is quite interesting not to talk, not to speak about uh, any kind of emancipatory dimension of technologies, but rather of uh, cases and of cases of interperception of, and s subverting the very means of power, which. Uh, which is already using technologies and digital technologies as well. Uh, yeah, so probably this is the point I, I would uh, I would like to admit uh, because um, it was a very important issue of the thing which was called in the text we, which you already mentioned a few times. Uh, which is called uh, onto power. This is a concept introduced by Brian Masumi, uh, who realized that shift, which is, uh, which uh, appeared in the field of practices of power and power relations, now when uh, mm, some of them uh, oriented are oriented to preempt something which is potential but is not actually present like something like uh, like uh, like U U Ukrainian uh, integration of Ukraine to NATO which is something which f for me personally as, as I see, in my opinion, this is one of the main reasons why uh, Putin's government started this war. Yeah, because uh, in order to preempt this integration or like this huge repressions, which the uh, Rus a uh, few uh, some time ago, uh, in order to preempt social instability, not some some kind of concrete events, but uh, the instability at all. So probably this performance is uh, maybe seen also as a, a kind of way to imagine uh, any kinds of rebellious machines which uses the forgetting in order to uh, to resist this preemption, yeah, forgetting, forgetting of something which only could happen in spite of preempt these events. Yes, and I would like also to add on this uh, preemptive politics uh, that, um, like, uh, there is uh, such a thing uh, which I find sometimes problematic, um, uh, which is problem solving. Um, kind of uh, technique uh, inside of uh, te algorithmized technologies, uh, which is basically uh, uses the preemptive methods like uh, that we might have uh, certain uh, problems that we would need to deal with, uh, but uh, those problems are kind of uh, could sometimes be uh, not very related uh, to the um, reality and uh, also it's part of the um, startup uh, kind of thinking, uh, which is um, um, 
you know, based on this uh, math before relationships. And so um, what was important during the Belarusian revolution is that, that uh, those technologies, uh, algorithmic size, that appeared, uh, they appeared only because it was a political need for it. Um, and people uh, were the operators of these machines. So no one, you know, uh, made this tool for you, uh, but rather you are creating um, something to operate with, um, your own bodies that are right now uh, like needing this very thing. Yeah, in this context, um, I was also curious, um, since we're discussing about uh, art strategies or strategies in art, um, whether there was any um, example that we could think of, um, especially maybe Oleksii coming from a moving image uh, background, and since we talked about uh, visual cultures and how we deal with visual cultures, if we trust them or not, um, I was wondering, yeah, whether you, any of you has like an example um, that we could share. Like I remember um, us speaking about the Free Filmers Collective, um, for example, mm -hmm. which I think was interesting. Yeah, but uh, I would rather uh, tell that um, Free Filmers Collective, which is a collective um, from all over the Ukraine, from different regions, and they usually do films, but also sometimes they use other mediums as well. Uh, yeah, that this collective, uh, at the very beginning of the war, they stated that uh, filmmaking nowadays is uh, like serving people with humanitarian aid, and this is how they mm, can still uh, this is how they can still uh, fulfill their artistic practices, but uh, in a way which is uh, related rather to the actual state of affairs than of uh, uh, working with, uh, uh, with uh, imagination or any kind of, um, of potential uh, potentiality as, as at all. And this, uh, actually, I would like to point out that uh, such kind of approach is not, um, I think it shouldn't be reduced to the idea that uh, artistic practices should be rather related to something which is actual, but uh, not to the something which is potential, but rather to the very uh, point where potential may become an actual state of affairs. So probably humanitarian aid is something quite um, significant in this case because humanitarian aid is actually something which is uh, which uh, makes something potential like um, I mean, like just uh, people just make it uh, actual something which really exists. Yeah, so probably this case uh, is significant in this very um, in this very issue of uh, mutual interrelations between. Uh, Potentiality and actuality between something which may be urgent or hurt uh, and something which is actually happening, something like more metabolic, let me say, some more like, metabolic issues. Something more metabolic, did you say? Yeah, metabolic, yeah. I mean, just like the very, the very. Uh, like material is not a, a, a very accurate term, but uh, probably metabolic is better. 
Maybe I just jump, yeah. jump in here. Um, I mean, I think it's interesting to think about uh, specific artists that use the lens of art and specifically the environmental landscape of the arts in order to provide space to either create nuanced lenses of information or to offer up potential activism. Um, I mean, there's quite a lot of very effective ones, I would say, forensic architecture, contemporary and, for example. But actually, just listening now, I was kind of thinking maybe we should open it further beyond the notion of art and instead think of it through the lens of culture. Because also, of course, under the umbrella of CTM, many of these places, they can get a little bit frustrating when we think about the definition of activism, you know, to be active, to be reactive, to position oneself in a state of momentum of change. And often when we're kind of reflecting in these places of culture, they don't seem to offer that up. It can seem somehow um, hyperbolic or at least stagnant. And what I've come to think about in terms of these spaces, which could also be um, optimism, <laughs> is that maybe those spaces are our safe spaces, those spaces where we reconvene, where we offer radical terms and conditions of care and thinking and offer a space to be together. And that doesn't always have to necessarily be productive, but instead could be reproductive. So sort of moving away from this um, notion of like capitalist infrastructure of constantly needing to product, uh, to be productive, but instead to think about how we begin to realize another modus of production, one that's on our terms and through our cultural belief systems. And I definitely felt that like these exercises for me offered me like a space of pause rather than necessarily a moment where I knew exactly what I wanted to do with it. And I think this is maybe also in terms of culture, this moment where we can offer up a polarity of reflections and where we can potentially come together or offer alternative nodes and test sites. But I think these kind of moments of maybe also thinking about like kind of Sarah Ahmed's idea of those moments where like you feel uncomfortable, where you don't know what to do, where you have to negotiate those desires of practice but are not able to. And maybe actually the arts and culture and music are some of those places where we can begin to feel uncomfortable safely in order to be able to participate more fluidly and collectively in the social body. Maybe if I may uh, jump in, Penny, um, I was wondering about um, also Alexi's response in your work and this um, highly digitized war that's taking place at the moment where um, bodies are being identified from uh, uh, web crawling data. Um, and um, I thought um, about Basil van der Kalk's uh, book, um, uh, the Body Keeps the Score, which I think was released in 2014 and um, has seen a bit of a resurgence. A lot of people, I think, have read it through the pandemic because there are all these sort of layers of violence that we experienced and that were discussed on a different panel earlier today as well. Um, the violence of being perhaps a woman who um, is at home and has to take on additional domestic work or um, um, or is being violated in in that home, the violence of being um, stuck in the, the in in the space as some of us were, um, 
while it was, I think, very much a pluralistic experience, we didn't all have the same experience of the of the pandemic. But in terms of artistic practice, I wondered um, this sort of um, embodied experience we are, we are speaking of. Um, you and your practice um, uh, use a lot of body work, um, Penny, and also um, in the co-curation of Radical Friends at the Haus der Kunst, um, Omsk Social Club, where I uh, curated um, to have these bodywork sessions. And um, so I'm trying to formulate a question <laughs> around um, um, a tactical forgetting and how this is a, a response in terms, um, um, I think you mentioned also, um, it's a, um, it's a, a a kind of um, survival uh, mechanism, in a sense. Um, but, um, and I, I think it's it's really interesting that when we talk about um, blockchain and the potential, the transformative potential this technology may, may have for the cultural space, to also think about um, the embodied experience we have in cultural spaces. And I wondered, um, and maybe you don't want to speak to this, Penny, but I wondered why um, the bodywork has such significance in your in your practice, in your artistic practice, as well as in your uh, curating practice, and um, and I'm also alluding to the 52-hour workshop, which um, kind of served as a primer, uh, where um, Zina and Nikolai were also present to the DAO program. Um, so there was this real a mixture of having these um, um, intense um, bodywork sessions, as well as um, theoretical discussions and, and um, so, so, yeah, I wondered if you might want to speak to that a little bit. Sure. Um, I guess for me personally, why uh, using the body is so important is about this notion of embodied knowledge and about um, I consciously believe that we're not only made up of verbalizations and um, listening sonic influences when we are together as a unit of collective bodies. I believe that we have energetic fields. I believe that we are constantly negotiating them and part and parcel of the reason um, that I feel that we've also potentially gone into a certain vein in terms of technology, um, which I think is also like big tech, often sits within a more traditional, rational enlightenment science and technology physique rather than a more kind of um, grassroots or potentially embodied space. And so, I mean, even right now, I, I definitely feel a little stiff sitting up here with you all sitting down there. Like, you know, this is not my most comfortable way to discuss, uh, nor really to think, actually, if I'm totally <laughs> honest. Um, and. I feel that if we don't begin to sort of shake the shackles of cooperation when we commune together, um, I don't understand how we would possibly be able to think externally to the potential propaganda that we are continually fueled with, not only through a neoliberal lens, through a capitalist lens, um, but also through a modern lens. And I solidly stand alongside thinkers like Federico Campagna, who believes that technology is an extension of the body, our human bodies, it was written and coded by humans, it is part of our minds, and unless we begin to think bodily, I believe that we will lose a very strong part of being human through an intersectional methodology, which I think that many big technological 
code and also theory and also methodology stems very often um, from a ruling elite that is typically a cisgendered white male uh, from the West. And I think that for many of these technologies, the lack of intersectionality is very, very present in not only the way it is delivered, um, the either transparency, opacity, the mysticism behind it, but also um, the way in which the world is shaped by it. And I think until we begin to understand that we will not become machines, or if we do, it won't be a good thing, then we need to start taking into consideration when we discuss these topics, like our very flesh, where it is, what it's next to, who we're next to, who we're speaking to, and um, for me, I find the strongest way to do that is to remove the senses that we typically navigate this world within, which are potentially the senses that can be tricked the easiest and um, can also be maybe un... I don't know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that basically if we remove um, verbal, visual, and sonic tendencies from our immediate answers and responses, we will probably find um, many more conclusions um, between us. And I think that's also systemic to this notion that I was trying to speak to before about reflection. And I definitely don't have the answers and um, that's something that is very vulnerable, I think, especially when you're supposed to be a theorist in a certain <laughs> uh, subject matter. Um, but I think that kind of um, notion of vulnerability for me is more easily expressed uh, through embodied knowledge and to also understand that everybody is coming from a position of understanding technology. It's just a very varied position. And I think that's also interesting through the lens of art because in terms of visuals, in terms of storytelling, in terms of worlding, in terms of um, information spreading, you know, these are actually all moduses to which we not only um, perform culture, but these wars are also being performed through these mediums, like the um, nation states perform through these mediums. And I think there is something a little, or what still fascinates me about the arts is the fact that, you know, there's so much pushback normally um, from nation states. Arts is particularly the first thing that always gets money slashed from. It's the first thing in the Bildzeitung to be um, made a humorous or embarrassing situation. But actually, you know, our tools are the ones that are often utilized when it comes to a certain agenda. So maybe actually the tools of culture or dissemination of knowledge and information are actually more powerful than we think. And that throughout the years, we've been pushed to a part of society that uh, is seen as a luxury. And actually, maybe in terms of... I'm going to let someone else take over, because I'm rambling. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I think there was a lot of good points in it. Um, 
I want to go back to um, this idea of um, embodiment and um, but starting from not the individual body but let's say from how we connect to each other right because this is something I guess that's um, structured by the very infrastructure obviously and then by digital infrastructure um, and I think this is something you're working on a lot when you're um, creating social situations um, as your artistic practice um, so I was wondering if we could talk a bit um, sort of maybe to close um, this question also on uh, decentralization, decentralizing our individualistic uh, <laughs> bodies into a sort of multitude or a sort of um, community maybe or um, group. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you uh, for this question. Um, well, I have several uh, thoughts in mind. Uh, <laughs> maybe somehow we can prolong uh, thoughts of each other. Um, well, from one side, um, I'm thinking, where is the I think Alexi? Alexi. <laughs> <laughs> From Who another does? side, uh, I'm thinking about um, like decentralization, um, um, like with whom um, and like how it is organized as well, because uh, decentralization can be easily taken over, uh, as we see with the example of uh, state uh, financial systems, uh, which are using private blockchains uh, and things like that. Um, uh, but from another side, um, also uh, we have um, um, if we look at the dis decentralization uh, kind of, uh, we see uh, that um, infrastructurally uh, there are uh, a lot of nodes, uh, but here we also need to think about um, like how equal are the nodes or because the position of power, uh, it's also part of, of this question um, that um, uh, sometimes it ha can happen that someone uh, takes this power uh, because decentralization doesn't always lead uh, to the powerless structures. Um, yes, um, from one side. From another side, I wanted to, to comment on um, uh, also collective um, actions, um, cultural actions and revolutionary actions uh, during Belarusian revolution uh, that were built in a kind of um, anonymous uh, and collective way um, in order not to have, uh, also because, you know, uh, partly um, how we can deal with the community value um, and uh, can the value kind of uh, uh, can be taken back um, by the community. Mm. You mean like um, different peer-to-peer uh, -peer production community trying to develop the systems where they can uh, prevent the extraction of the value from the labor processes? Mm. Yeah, th um, th yeah, this is a very good question now, and uh, uh, there is a, a lot of work to be done to solve this and with these changing circumstances. If we are talking about this um, uh, speculative value produced by uh, like desires put on the uh, algorithmized processes, and uh, as Alexei mentioned, this. Uh, technologies of perception of different constellations of human bodies in a different agents. I don't know. Yeah, I don't have uh, the proper language to describe it now, but I have some intuition that it could be um, interesting to unpack this uh, very specific situation of, uh, for example, like this DAOs, as a very, very geeky uh, technology. This is, uh, but with a lot of uh, work and desire put onto it to produce this value. And um, I have a lot of critique of it, but I, I, now I want to uh, speak a bit of uh, the potential of. Um, using it as a playground to unpack the situation when the human bodies kind of been into the, in the between of this materialized speculation process when um, 
There is no option to be outside, but it's not so hostile like a war machines, but this is a machines of speculation, but algorithmicized ones. And this uh, intersection of these vectors is quite interesting for me in my practice. Yeah, and uh, if I think about um, the question of the, the, um, any kind of uh, distribution or decentralization, um, I think it's important to have the institutions or like, mm, like a <laughs> narratives uh, to go through collectively to, um, to insist on uh, one technologies and decline in other ones and have a voice for this. Uh, not to be um, like a receiver of um, something that was developed somewhere by someone and uh, um, but having the this gap uh, um, uh, to play with this, maybe in a non-productive, like a, in a reproductive way, to, uh, um, to play with these new phenomena and new technological materiality in a, uh, different ways, so somehow ungluing from this dominant narrative of uh, speculating on new things, in a, in a favor for future value, but having another institution that can unpack this whole process and see it from another angle. Yeah, and maybe this is the, my answer to your previous question about the, the, the place of the art there. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, well, uh, I'm going to try to wrap this up, but I think there's no way for me. Um, but um, what I take away, of course, I, uh, is um, self-organization is, I guess, the way um, we're um, aiming for. And um, it's a lot of work, <laughs> to quote you. Um, thank you so much for participating in the conversation. Um, I don't know if we still have a little bit of time for questions. Um, People are shaking the head. Maybe we can take one if there should be a, a small <laughs> question. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Tina Kola, Alexei. Jenny, thanks so much for the very interesting discussion. I was thinking um, if we already speaking of forgetting as a mental function, I was wondering. Um, do you think also to work in this, um, to use the media for other psychic kind of, um, maybe even therapeutic um, goals, in a sense, especially speaking of war and the situation, let's say the long aftermath will be definitely affected also in a psychic way. Do you think of, um, we could use machines for, let's say, therapeutic, um, in therapeutic dimensions, because I also know this one work you made on psychotherapy of Uber Uber drivers. Just thinking of that, did you? Yeah. So because forgetting, in the sense, as I understood, you can also have this positive, let's say, um, relief function, right? And even maybe have an impact on certain traumas or certain traumatic events. So maybe extending this idea. Um, could you imagine to enlarge this, the scope of um, your work into this, um, yeah, the transfer functions and the therapeutic dimensions of media? This would be my question, just like leading maybe even beyond the work presented today. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, we haven't been discussing that, uh, but um, I think maybe in our case uh, we mostly uh, thought um, about this revolutionary action because we haven't uh, embodied the war, um, but uh, maybe Oleksii um, 
um, can uh, say a few words about um, like uh, the war situation, but also it's kind of hard, um, you know, to to, to imagine uh, these things uh, while there is, um, of course, an urgency to stop uh, the war. Um, yeah, but also this sounds, for example, uh, that um, uh, we were using, uh, it's part of some uh, therapeutic techniques where people are actually, uh, from one side, can forget some fears, um, like embodied fears, and uh, can uh, deconcentrate uh, attention and kind of um, have this uh, partial continuous attention where you are simultaneously, uh, you know, scratching your hands uh, and perceiving uh, something or working at the computer and this all kind of works uh, in combination. So uh, it can be good um, to think about about mixing uh, also maybe different senses or um, uh, uh, taking into account what also uh, Penny uh, has said, um, that uh, our experiences are embodied um, and, you know, not to let the body uh, go somewhere uh, where only the technology stays, but uh, rather uh, differently. Alexey, would you like to add to that? I see you nodding. Yeah, thank you for your, thank you for your question. Um, uh, I would like to add something about forgetting because um, I just had a thought that uh, you know, forgetting is something quite familiar to... Uh, actually, forgetting is a process which is quite familiar to uh, fetishization of a product, yeah, uh, and uh, I really find it reasonable to uh, think of this play, which was uh, mentioned by Nicola, play with the means of power, with the means of uh, capitalist production and reproduction, um, because uh, uh, this is a forgetting which can be uh, somehow uh, extracted by the different forms of uh, resistance in order to uh, in order to subvert the very field of uh, social yeah and uh, speaking about uh, therapeutic dimension um, I would rather, uh, to, uh, especially therapeutic dimension of uh, uh, different uh, machinic practices during the war. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, actually I cannot add uh, something in particular because I think that um, at least uh, in my cycle of uh, um, Nobody just cares about uh, therapeutic dimensions because uh, actually practices of self-care and whatever are quite uh, difficult during the war. So, yeah, sorry if I didn't uh, get your question, but this is the answer. Thank you. Um, Let's uh, move the discussion uh, outside of the stage. <laughs> and um, I thank uh, Mario, Nikolai, Zina and Penny for the conversation. Of course, Oleksi, thank you so much for joining us online. Uh, it was great to have you. Thank you so much for your input. And um, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thank you very much to you all, um, Sarah, as well, for moderating. Um, we will continue the, um, the program with a short